Hey everyone, what's up? It's Rob Dotson. Today on Polycast, I'm gonna show you how to take your entire application and make it run offline, all without writing a single line of JavaScript. This is crazy, wicked, awesome stuff. So follow me and let me show you how it's done. So this is your web page today. When it needs an asset, it goes off to the network to request it. The network fetches that asset and then returns it so it can be displayed on screen. But as we know, this back and forth is not always so perfect. Sometimes the request could take a long time to get to the network. And maybe the network takes a long time to send the response back, or it takes a long roundabout way to do so. Perhaps the user loses connectivity along the way, dropping from 3G to Edge. Or maybe they lose connectivity entirely, in which case the network is just unavailable. So there's a lot of reasons why this back and forth dance is not always as seamless as we would like it to be. Now let's look at the same model, but this time with Service Worker. So Service Worker is a new standard that acts like a proxy, letting you intercept network requests in JavaScript, and then allowing you to handle them how you see fit. So the user makes a request, which flows through our Service Worker. And when the response comes back from the network, the Service Worker can decide what it wants to do with it. It could, for instance, create a cache and actually store the response in that cache and then return it to the user. So the next time the user makes a request for the same asset, the service worker can check the cache, see that it's inside of there, and return that instead of having to hit the network. This basically enables a really nice offline model. Now, there are a bunch of other things that you could do here. You could have the service worker hit the network and the cache at the same time and make the two race. Uh, there's a ton of patterns that are detailed by my friend Jake Archibald in his offline cookbook, and I really encourage you to check that out after you're done with this video. But what if you're in a browser that doesn't have support for Service Worker? Well, in that case, you just go back to the way things were before. Your page tries to hit the network, and the network sends back a response if it can. Nothing breaks in this model, and in that way, Service Worker is just a progressive enhancement. And that's why Service Worker is kind of brilliant. If you have a subset of your users that can support Service Worker, well, then they get an enhanced experience, something that's a little bit more engaging. And for your users that can't support it because perhaps their browser doesn't implement it yet, well, they're going to get the same experience that they get today. So it's not a matter of choosing whether to use Service Worker or not. Instead, you can look at Service Worker as an additional layer that you can add to your application to give some of the users a much better experience. I think this is pretty awesome. And if you're interested, there are actually strategies around using things like app cache as a fallback if Service Worker is not supported. In general, if you're interested in learning more, there's this really great write-up by Matt Gaunt, which goes into a lot of detail. There's a lot of really good material out there. So after you're done with this video, definitely go do a bit of additional research there. Now, to set up your own Service Worker usually involves a fair bit of code. You've got to configure your registration, and fetch events, and caching, blah. It's just like crazy. Now, thankfully, there's an element for that. Thanks to the new Platinum Element Collection from the Polymer team, you actually get Service Worker support for free. It's already set up in Polymer Starter Kit, and so I'm going to show you how to use it. This is what we're going to build today. It is a very typical Polymer Starter Kit app. Uh, you can see here, though, that as I'm using it, I can set it to offline. I can then go and click around and use the app, and it'll continue to work. I can even click this button to load an image of a map from the network, and that works as well. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing you got to do is go and download Polymer Starter Kit. You can grab it off of the site at developers.google.com. Then you're going to want to go to the GitHub page for Starter Kit and check out this guide on enabling service worker support. It's actually pretty easy. You just need to uncomment a few lines of HTML and then add this little pre-cache gulp task to the bottom of your build file. Now, some of you might wonder, like, why is this disabled at all? You know, why, why not just have Service Worker running by default? And in fact, in previous versions of Starter Kit, it was enabled by default. But what we found was that could be very confusing for users who weren't expecting Service Worker to take over their local host port. And suddenly, they were developing a completely separate site and they were seeing the offline version of Polymer Starter Kit. So because there was some confusion around that, we decided to make Service Worker support an opt-in feature. So that way, when you're using it, you know exactly what you're getting. OK, 
Let's go through the steps to add service worker support. The first thing we're going to do is hop into our index.html file and scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page. And you'll see this block of commented text here. So uncomment that. Inside of here, we've got a paper toast, which is a little notification that will display in the corner, letting the user know that their app works offline. We've got this platinum service worker register element and then a platinum service worker cache element. So the service worker register element is what is actually going to create and register your service worker in the document. It has a few important attributes I want to detail. The first is this auto register attribute. This tells the element to go ahead and actually set up the service worker and kick it off. If this was not here, you would have to write a little bit of JavaScript to get that process going. This skip waiting attribute tells the service worker to skip the waiting phase and go right to its active phase. Normally, during a service worker update, it's going to wait to see if all of the user's tabs are closed. If they're all, you know, you might have multiple tabs open on the same site. It would wait to see if all of those were closed before trying to activate. In this case, we're saying, don't worry about that. It's OK if they have multiple tabs on the same page open. Just go ahead and do your thing. This last one, client's claim, tells the service worker that once it is activated, it should go ahead and immediately take control of the page and start intercepting uh, fetch requests. So combining these two is a pretty powerful pattern. Now, the cache element that you see down here, it's going to handle adding files to the cache and returning those to us. And it's got this default cache strategy, which right now is set up to be network first, meaning it's going to go off to the network. And if something 404s, then it's going to hit the cache. You could set this to cache first, or you could even set it to like cache only. There's a few different strategies here that you can work with. Lastly, you've got this precache file attribute. The precache JSON here is a manifest file of file paths. It's basically an array of file paths that we want the service worker to precache for us once it boots up. So these are things that maybe the user hasn't even seen yet, but we just know they're going to need. So we're going to tell the service worker, grab all those assets as soon as you start. I'm actually going to come back to this in a little bit. But let's move ahead now to look at what we need to do to get the rest of this working. So over in our elements HTML file, we're going to go down here a little bit, and we're going to uncomment these two imports. These are for our platinum elements. And now they can load into our app. We can run gulp serve. We can boot up our local server. It's actually going to open the browser for us when it's ready. And then we can see our app here. We'll notice in the bottom left that we get this notification that caching is complete and we are working offline. And in fact, we can verify that by opening up our dev tools and turning on mobile emulation mode. And you can see I'm going to go in here. I'm going to use the network throttler to throttle the page so that it's offline. And now we can refresh. Our content will continue to load. We can open our sidebar. We can click around. You can see that the different routes are loading. So this is looking pretty good. But we go to the contact page, and we click this little button down here. And our image is giving us a 404. So what's happening? So at this point, Service Worker is dynamically caching assets as the user is navigating through the site. But what I want to do is ensure that that map is available to the user, even if they haven't actually visited that page yet. So to do that, I'm going to have to tell the Service Worker to pre-cache an asset. And let me show you how to do that. OK, so the asset that we want to pre-cache is this map JPEG file. And if you recall, I said that there's this precache JSON thing, which is like a manifest of files that we want the service worker to cache for us, even if the user hasn't seen them yet. So if we want to add some files to that, a really simple way to do so is to add another attribute to this element. This attribute is just called precache. And we can pass this attribute an array that is a JSON array. So notice how I'm using single quotes on the outside here so that I can use double quotes on the inside. That's because JSON only takes double quotes. We can give it a JSON array of file paths that should merge into that manifest JSON, or sorry, precache JSON. So with just this one file path here, my app is actually all set up and everything's going to work. But as I was doing this, it really got me thinking, like, what's the deal with this file? Like, Where does it come from? How is it built? What's inside of it? So for that, we're going to go inside of our gulp file. And we've got this precache task that we can look at inside of here. And what it's doing is it's building a little glob of file paths. And a glob, if you've never heard of that before, is basically an array of file paths that are generated using this string. And this string is sort of like a regular expression. It says match anything in the elements directory, anything in the scripts directory, anything in the styles directory, 
any subfolders, any files in there. So it's, a, it's pretty wide open. Anything in any of those directories, match it and add it to this manifest file. Uh, we've also got this line right here where we're pushing individual files into that array, like our web components polyfills and our index file. So if you needed to do something like cache an entire folder full of assets, rather than put that into the precache attribute in our HTML, we could actually drop it in here. We could say cache everything in the images directory. Now, that's one option. And if you wanted to pass just individual files, another option would be to add it to this little push call. Uh, you could do this, although it's probably easiest to just do this in the markup because it's just a single attribute there. But I wanted you to know about how this thing worked and, and the options that are available to you. Now, the last step in this process is to make sure that we have enabled the precache task to run inside of the gulp default task. So we'll add precache here. And what this does is it ensures when someone is doing a distribution build that it generates that precache JSON file for them. At this point, we're done. Everything is going to work. We can hop back over to our browser. We can refresh the page. Uh, you'll notice that I've set throttling to offline again. And I can go and click around. And as I get to that contact section, I can click on the Show Me the Map button. It's going to hit the network, or in this case, the cache, and load in our map image. So like I said, this is freaking cool. You've got your entire application working offline, and you didn't even have to write a single line of JavaScript. It just magically happened thanks to the power of Web Components and Service Worker. That's it for today, folks. If you have questions, please leave them down in the comments. I do try to read all those if I can. Also, be sure to click that little subscribe button so you don't miss any episodes. Again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Hey there, Playcasters. Rob here. Q&A time. Uh, this week's question comes from Dr. Rob Rez, so hi there, doctor, uh, who asks, in Polymer 1.0, can we do data bindings inside of our styles like we used to be able to do with the old core style element? Or is the recommended approach to do data bindings inside of your class names? So for instance, you might have like class foo, bar, and then a data binding for another class called baz. So really good question there. Uh, in Polymer 1.0, you cannot currently do data bindings inside of styles. That is something that we're thinking about putting on the roadmap, but right now there's no real ETA for that. Uh, also, you cannot do like binding expressions inside of strings. So the recommended approach is to take your entire class list and generate what is called a, or I guess what we're calling, a computed binding out of that. So you can check out this link right here to read about doing computed bindings down in the docs. Uh, these are pretty cool. You can pass arguments to them, and they can return a string, which will fill out your entire class list for you. So really awesome question. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have questions, please leave them down in the comments. We try and read and answer all of those if we can. And maybe we can feature you on the next episode of Polycast. Again, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to click that little subscribe button down there, and I'll see you next time.